As we saw in my Excavating the Empty Tomb series, not plugging, not plugging. Okay, maybe just a little. The author of Mark borrowed heavily from Homer's works as well as common Greek mythology, Jewish scripture, Josephus, and probably sources we haven't yet discovered. I made the claim that Mark's gospel was a work of fiction, intended as a work of fiction, and that if his gospel is the foundation for the other gospels, as well as the book of Acts, what does that say about those works? But is Mark, quote unquote, the only New Testament author who borrowed from previous fictional tales in order to create his own amazing fiction? We won't need to concern ourselves with whether any Luke was the author of Acts or whether he wrote the passage in question. For the purposes of this video, I'll assume that the same person who wrote the Gospel of Luke wrote Acts as well, as well as the scene we are about to examine. But bear with me for a moment as I take a quick side street concerning parallels. There is a natural tendency to find parallels where none exist. People see faces in clouds, find patterns where there are none, and so on. This actually has a name. It's called pareidolia. People can become convinced of just about anything, but we have to be careful we don't fall into that same trap when considering if a scene from one text, which we'll call our hypertext, is actually a copy from another previous text, which we'll call the hypotext. Hypo meaning under and hyper meaning over. So the underlying text is our hypotext. There are countless books, it seems, that claim all kinds of pagan parallels and astrology parallels, but just because you find something that seems to match doesn't mean the later author necessarily borrowed from that source or borrowed at all. We might just use our intuition and gut feeling, but maybe if we had some actual criteria by which we could judge the relative strength of a proposed parallel, we could feel a little more confident that we weren't just seeing things. Here are the criteria Dr. MacDonald lays out in his book, The Homeric Epics and the Gospel of Mark, from which most of my information about this example from Acts is derived. 1. Accessibility 2. Analogy 3. Density 4. Order 5. Distinctiveness and 6. Interpretability Accessibility means that the later author had to have access to the previous work, or at least access to a copy of it, etc. Analogy means that we are looking for other authors who also copied the scene in question or perhaps from the work as a whole. If there were several authors who also copied Homer, it makes the case for copying stronger in any given author's work. Conversely, if no other author copied from Homer, then our case for copying becomes weaker. Density refers to how many matching or inverted items we find between the two accounts. More matches strengthens the case, obviously. Less matches weakens it. Order refers to the order we find our matches in. If the order is relatively identical between the two works, then our case is stronger. For example, if the hypertext has events A, C, G, and F, and the earlier hypotext has events A, C, G, and F, then we have a stronger case than if the matches were out of sequence. Distinctiveness is very important. We want to find matches that on their own would be hard to believe as mere coincidences. Quick example, let's suppose that the hypertext says a man took a plastic soft drink bottle and painted it with fluorescent orange paint. The hypotext says that a man took a plastic soft drink bottle and painted it with bright orange colors. Unless there was a tradition of painting soft drink bottles, we have a very distinctive event here, and the match between the two texts becomes stronger, or makes our case for a true parallel become stronger. A quick example of non-distinctiveness would be a later story saying a man took a soft drink bottle made of plastic and dropped it into the garbage can and our hypotext, or earlier story, saying that a man took a soft drink bottle made of plastic and dropped it into a garbage can. Here we have an exact match. So why wouldn't this be a real case of copying? Well, obviously, because the event is so common that both authors could easily come up with the event independently. It is a common occurrence for people to throw away soft drink bottles. Finally, interpretability means that the proposed hypotext 
has the ability to interpret, clarify, or make sense of the hypertext. Often the hypertext is enigmatic or downright weird, but if we could just know the text from which the author was copying, we'd then understand his changes to the hypotext and why those changes and inversions may have created anomalies or strange things in his version. We will see this come up in the scene in question. Now, I don't think there's a set of specific criteria for proving a parallel, but these criteria will give us a relative guideline for establishing true parallels rather than just relying on a gut feeling or just concluding that any kind of match must point to copying. Now, at the expense of making this a two-part vid, we need to actually read the two texts and then begin to lay out the parallels between the account of Paul in the upper room from Acts 20 with the scene of Elpenor's death from the Odyssey. On the first day of the week, when we convened to break bread, Paul spoke to them, and because he wanted to leave the next day, he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were plenty of lamps in the upper room where we were gathered. A certain young man named Eutychus was seated at the window and was carried off by a deep sleep because of Paul's having spoken for so long. Carried off by sleep, he fell from the third story and was lifted up dead. Paul went down, lay upon him, embraced him, and said, Don't raise a ruckus, his soul is in him. Paul went back upstairs, broke bread, and once he had eaten and had spoken for a long time until dawn, he left. Then they took the lad alive and were not a little relieved. There are some very odd things in this account, but these will be explained by understanding the underlying text that Luke was copying from. Now, let me read the Elpenor account. There was a man, Elpenor, the youngest in our ranks, none too brave in battle, none too sound in mind. He strayed from his mates in Circe's magic halls and keen for the cool night air, sodden with wine, he'd bedded down on her roofs. But roused by the shouts and tread of marching men, he leapt up with a start at dawn, but still so dazed he forgot to climb back down again by the long ladder. Head first from the roof he plunged, his neck snapped from the backbone. His soul flew down to the house of Hades. Then when Odysseus makes it to Hades, he's shocked to see Elpenor there because he didn't know Elpenor had died. And Elpenor asked him to burn his body and burn his armor and put an oar on his tomb. And then later, Odysseus is explaining this to the king of the Phaeacians, King Alcinous. As soon as dawn with her rosy fingers shone again, I dispatched some men to Circe's halls to bring the dead Elpenor's body. We cut logs in haste and out on the island's sharpest jutting headland, held his funeral rites in sorrow, streaming tears. Once we'd burned the dead man and the dead man's armor, keeping his grave mound, hauling a stone that coped it well, we planted his balanced oar aloft to crown his tomb. Now here are the parallels that we find between the two accounts, uh, but I'll save the juiciest one for last. You know me. I like to reserve the knockout blow for the ending. 